Welcome back to Bad Radio Art with Sam. We've already discussed the basics of what makes the world go round, and now we'll take a very quick tour around that terrifying invisible force that brings us radio, but also a never-ending stream of Sonic the Hedgehog sequels, electronics. So what is electricity? It is energy from charged particles, usually electrons. Electrons in particle physics are negatively charged, but that's not quite important to what we're talking about here. Since we're talking about the movement and the effects of electrical power, we have names for the directions in which electricity flows. Those directions are positive and negative. In wiring, we usually associate positive with the color red and negative with the color black. Positive and negative are most important in DC applications, but positive and negative shows up in a lot of places. We're going to be showing off a few electrical effects in this video, and the star of our show is that amazing device currently taking over the world, the LED. We'll describe them later, but we should introduce them now. So I just said DC, and I should talk about what that is. DC stands for direct current, and it is basically a constant push of electricity. If you were to graph it, it wouldn't look very interesting. In DC power, one wire is positive, and the other wire is negative, as you can see with these wires. When the right amount of power is pushed through the LED, it just lights up as you'd expect. Good LED light bulbs ultimately use DC power. I say ultimately because the other basic type of electrical power is AC, or alternating current. AC current is a wave, exactly the kind of wave we discussed in the last episode. Instead of one wire being positive and the other wire negative, the wires switch their polarity as the wave crosses the zero point. If I put a red LED on correctly set up AC power, it fades in and out. This is because you're only seeing one side of the wave. If I were to take a blue LED and wire it backwards on the same wires, you would see the LEDs alternate in their fading. This is because the red LED is powered by the upper half of the wave, and the blue LED is powered by the lower half. Household wiring is AC, and radio waves are also AC. In fact, since mains wiring, another word for household wiring, is AC and has a frequency of 60 Hz, the wiring in your house can be thought of as a radio wave. The LED light bulbs in your home have power supplies in them that convert the AC power of the mains into DC power that work best with LEDs. This is why I said good LEDs ultimately use DC power. Bad LED light bulbs don't convert to DC and thus flicker 60 times a second because of the 60 Hz frequency of home wiring and thus give me headaches. And just as an aside, while there is positive DC here, there can also be negative DC current. This is occasionally important in audio applications. Alright, now we need to talk about how electricity moves. To do this, I'm going to convert my LED light into a continuity tester. You've played with a continuity tester before if you built the Jewel Thief in 2022. Remember those electric chopsticks? A continuity tester, well, tests if electricity is flowing through a circuit, or in this case, a material. To demonstrate electrical flow, we have a can of soup. The can is made of metal, which allows electricity to flow through it. When the LED is on, electricity is flowing. When the LED is off, electricity is not flowing. The bottom of the can has a plastic lining and therefore does not allow electrical flow. All right, let's open the soup. The inside of the can, also made of metal, allows electrical flow. And now for the soup. Ah, shit. The soup conducts electricity. It doesn't flow as well, but it does pass enough to light up the LED. It's got so much salt in it, that's why. How that happens is best left to the student for the moment. Okay, rescue banana. Let's continue. Materials which allow electricity to flow are called conductors. The metal can is a good conductor. Thanks to horrible salt levels, the soup is a less good conductor. Materials which do not allow electricity to easily flow are called insulators. The banana, blocking our small amount of current, is an insulator. The wires we're using to test this property are conductive copper strings surrounded by an insulative plastic that protects us and other objects from that electrical flow. Thank you, Rescue Banana. You were delicious. One thing I forgot to mention is how we talk about electrical flow. Electrical potential flows from the positive to the negative. Strangely enough, the actual electrons flow the other way, but the electrical potential, which we are measuring and use, flows from the positive to the negative. 
Negative is also sometimes called ground. Many electrical devices, including ones at the broadcast radio station you'll be taking over on Saturday, require a direct connection to the Earth for grounding. This is called Earth ground. Okay, next, some terminology. Just like with waves, and anything else in science and engineering, we really need to know how to measure electricity. And unsurprisingly, there are a lot of things that need to be measured. Fortunately, you've already heard of a lot of these things, but let's describe them a little more in depth. There are three terms here, but there's a fourth missing one that we'll talk about in a bit. The actual flow of electricity, often called current, is measured in amperes, often shortened to amps, which I pretty much universally do. Electrical potential, often metaphorically referred to as pressure, is measured in volts. Opposition to electrical flow, otherwise known as resistance, is measured in ohms. The symbol for amp is a capital A, the symbol for volt is a capital V, and the symbol for ohm is the Greek omega, which I'm actually pretty good at drawing since I have to do it so much. And yes, all three of these terms are named after European physicists from the 18th and 19th centuries. The development of electricity is pretty much that era, but a lot of these folks have interesting or otherwise weird stories, so it's worth checking out. There is a common image that I believe dates to a World War II or Korean War military manual, but unfortunately I was unable to find a source. It shows the relationship of these three terms very well, but take warning, this is a metaphor and has problems, much like you'll often find with metaphors. Here it is. The tunnel here is supposed to represent a wire. I'm going to call the figures guys because I'm unremittingly Midwestern, but you call them what you like. And to make it easier, let me draw hats on them. The red-hatted guy trying to shrink the wire the blue-hatted guy is climbing through is resistance. The reason the metal was a better conductor than the soup is because of this guy. The soup had more of it than the metal. The banana had the most resistance of all three materials, but everything, including metal and including you, has some. The blue-hatted guy trying to climb through the wire is the amps, and could be said to represent the actual flow of electrons. The green-hatted guy pushing the blue-hatted guy are the volts and represent the potential energy from the power source. There are devices that measure these terms, and they are, fortunately, boringly named. Amps are measured with an ammeter, ohms are measured with an ohm meter, and volts are measured with a voltmeter. Fortunately, we don't have to carry all this stuff around when we check or debug electrical circuits. We have the mighty multimeter, a device that can measure these things and more. You've probably seen me use one before, and in fact, I have several. The test wants you to know that there are ways to damage multimeters when you're measuring for volts when set to resistance and the like. Check your book for that, and we will talk more about that during Radio Weekend. So we know now what units we're measuring, but what sort of things are we measuring them on? Circuits. Here's a couple of old circuits we have lying around. Those things we built at camp for the last couple of years are also circuits. Here's Becky's Jewel Thief and my Sad Meter Powered by Jewel Thief Super Combo. Circuits are made of components connected together by either metal traces on a circuit board or with wires like we do on our wooden block circuits. I'll be introducing, or reintroducing, you to some of these components later, but for now we need to talk about different ways of wiring circuits. Here, let me make one now. To start, we'll describe the fourth term for measuring electricity, the watt. Named for an 18th century Scottish mechanical engineer, the symbol for watts is a capital W. It is a measurement of overall power consumed by a circuit. It corresponds to one joule per second if you're inclined towards physics. While watt meters exist, you can get watts by multiplying volts by amps. This circuit here is supplied with 3.6 volts. Reconfiguring for amps, we get a reading of 76 milliamps, or 0.076 amps. Getting our calculator out, we multiply 3.6 by 0 0.076 and discover that this circuit consumes 0.274 watts. We'll talk about this a little more later. Now we need to talk about two different ways to wire circuits together. I'll be demonstrating these circuits with three blue LEDs. First is the parallel circuit. In parallel circuits, each component has its own connection to the power supply. You can kind of see why we call them parallel in the schematic here, in that the LEDs are all parallel to each other. A notable thing about parallel circuits is that when the connection to one LED is disrupted, the other LEDs can continue to function. In a parallel circuit, all components share voltage because they have their own connection to the supply. Wherever I test for voltage with my meter, it is the same. When I measure for current, I get different levels, 56 milliamps for one LED and then 96 milliamps for a different one. 
Oof, overdriving that last one. While the voltage remains the same, a different amount of current flows through each LED. In a series circuit, all components are lined up one after the other, in a line, or well, a series. In these circuits, all components share the same current, rather than voltage. As I test the voltage, I get different readings as I test the voltage for different components. While each component consumes a small amount of current, the same electrical flow has to go through each component for the circuit to work. In a series circuit, if one LED is disconnected, the whole circuit goes out and all the LEDs are shut off. In this situation, I have created an open circuit. When I reconnect the LED, all LEDs turn on and the circuit is closed. When I tried to measure for voltage with my meter set to amps, I accidentally created a short circuit. Short circuits can be pretty bad. A YouTube search of them will give you a few examples. It is called a short circuit because it actually shortens the circuit, preventing electricity from flowing to the proper places, often damaging equipment. Finally, we need to talk about how I'm measuring voltage and current here. To measure voltage, you can hook up your meter in parallel to the circuit under test, as I'm doing here. However, to measure current, the current must flow through your meter, so it must be hooked up like this. Okay, let's talk about relationships. Power relationships. Remember when I told you that watts were amps times volts? That's in a lot of places on your test, so let's talk about it a little bit more. You'd think the equation would be W equals V times A, right? I mean, so simple, yeah? No, 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 not at all. It's P equals I times E. These symbols were chosen well before all the terminology was sorted out, leading us with this rather unscientific discrepancy. Anyway, the P stands for power, and since watts are a measurement of power, that's easy to remember. Instead of A for amps, we have the letter I. I means intensity, which is a pretty good way to think about current, and it comes from the French. Volts transmogrifies into E, where it means electromotive force, and good luck with that. P is still measured in watts, I is still measured in amps, and E is still measured in volts, but it's P equals I times E. All right, let's try some math out. Let's say I've got a radio that runs on 12 volts and consumes 13 amps when transmitting. Well, that's simple. 12 times 13 equals 156, so that's 156 watts of power. It might be worthwhile to note here that the power consumed by the radio isn't 100% transformed into power transmitted, which is why my radio, which can consume up to 400 watts while transmitting, only actually sends out 100 watts. You win again, Entropy. All right, for a different example, let's say you've got a space heater for your home that's rated for 750 watts, and you need to find out how many amps it consumes. Since we're finding for amps, we have to do a little algebra here to swap that INP, and there, I equals P divided by E. Okay, we know the power, 750 watts. Since this plugs into a wall, we don't need to be told the voltage. House voltage is always 120 volts in the United States. So all that remains is for us to divide 750 by 120, and that gives us 6.25. Our 750 watt space heater consumes 6.25 amps. There's a simple graphic that helps people remember the relationships that looks like this. Just cover the figure you're looking to solve, and the relationship asserts itself. But frankly, between you, me, and everyone else on the internet, this, this is what I remember. And finally, it's time to talk about the law. Ohm's law. Ohm's law says the electric current between any two points in a conductor is directly proportional to the voltage between those two same points. It is also inversely proportional to the resistance. No, you just read that on Wikipedia. Fortunately, it's better remembered as a simple mathematical formula. And since it uses two terms from the previous equation, I'll just go straight to it. Here. E equals I times R. E is still voltage, and I is still current, but we have a new term here. What does R stand for? Robots. The second letter of frequency? Reprobate? Thankfully, no. It's resistance, which is easy to remember because this is Ohm's law, and resistance is measured in ohms. You can visualize it as a battery and some sort of device that consumes power. A generic device that consumes power is called a load, so let's go with that. In its most basic form, if we know the current flowing through the load, and we know its resistance, we can determine the voltage. Let's say we've got 2.4 amps of current running through a 10 ohm load. That gives us the easy math of 2.4 times 10, which won't bother with a calculator for this one, is 24 volts. Somewhat more usefully, if you pass a voltage through a load and can measure the current being consumed, you can figure out just how much that resistance is. 
Going back to mains wiring, we have a 120 volt supply and our lototron is consuming 1.5 amps. We once again algebra our equation to R equals E divided by I and that gives us 80, so our load has a resistance of 80 ohms. Much like the power relationships equation, there is a similar circle helper for Ohm's law, but I have an easier time remembering the equation than I do the circle, so here it is. And that's it for this, the most complex episode I've done so far, and I'm actually doing these episodes out of order. To the point that right now, I'm in Chicago for the holidays, and I don't have my markers on paper anymore. Anyway, give the exam over at imnotsquitting.com slash exam a try if you're up for it. Thanks for speedrunning electrical engineering with me, and I'll see you next week. We once again algebra our equation to R equals E divided by I, and that gives us 80, so our load has a resistance of 80 amps. What? What? <laughs>